Hello, my name is Daniel. I like to read and talk about things like innovation and design. And today I'd like to talk about the adjacent possible. So this is a simple depiction of this concept called the adjacent possible. And I'm going to use this visualization to describe some concepts about innovation strategy and practices that I hope you will find useful. The concept of the adjacent possible originated from Stuart Kaufman, who used it to describe evolutionary potential in biology. For any given genetic configuration, there are a limited number of ways in which it can change into another configuration. It has to do so roughly one step at a time. To put it in terms of strings of letters, the sequence ACA can become BCA or ADA with only a single iteration, but it can't suddenly become GGG. That configuration could perhaps become viable at some point for a certain context, but it has to get there through a, num uh, through a series of adjacent steps, one at a time. So a slime mold can't spontaneously mutate into a bird. It has to go through millions of iterative steps to ultimately get there, each of which is viable for the context, and each of the steps has to be adjacent to the previous one. The author, Stephen Johnson, describes the adjacent possible in innovation this way. He says, the, the adjacent possible is a kind of shadow future hovering on the edges of the present state of things, a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. It captures both the limits and the creative potential of change and innovation. In innovation, the concept of the adjacent possible describes things that are within the, the realm of current possibility. And I'd describe its shape and size as contained by these constraints, many of which are contextual. These probably among other constraints. So, for example, some of the constraints I've shown here are practices, perceptions, knowledge, technology, and resources. Something is within the realm of possibility if it doesn't demand resources or knowledge we don't have or technologies that don't exist. It can't demand that we behave in ways that are out of alignment with what could possibly be expected of us. And our behaviors are heavily modulated by perceptions, mental models, and knowledge. The technological and knowledge limitations explain this, the phenomenon of simultaneous invention. When the same thing is invented simultaneously by different people without any direct influence from one another. It's the kind of thing that has happened many times throughout history. And the reason this happens is because something enters within the realm of the global adjacent possible and multiple people who are looking for beneficial adjacencies will see it and kind of exploit it at the same time. So we should recognize that just because something is within the realm of technical possibility on Earth does not make it within the adjacent possible of a particular context. William Gibson described it in this way, the future is here, it's just not very evenly distributed. So because of this, we have to discover what is within the realm of the adjacent possible for a given context. We can't just take what works for another context and apply it to our own. As an example, we can't just take solutions that were developed for the highly modernized and privileged context of the United States and bring it into a context without the necessary infrastructure where there isn't consistent internet, electricity, maybe people don't have the time, attention, values, or appetite or desire for the solutions that work for us. Those aspects might all amount to what works here, not working there. This is one reason I like to define innovation as contextual. Something can simply be new to a context, and you could describe it as innovation. My favorite definition of innovation actually comes from the author, Dan Ward. He describes it as novelty with impact. So what works here won't necessarily work there. And that's one reason why in design, it's actually important to clearly understand the unique constraints and needs for a given context. Those aspects, not just what's possible technologically, 
are often what cause innovations to fail. There are a lot of examples of this. One that I have gone through a number of times myself is my attempt to bring better communication technologies to Air Force units, like introducing Slack or Millbook or Mattermost to a unit in the hopes that it solves some of the inherent problems with relying heavily on email. I have a number of times been met with localized constraints and barriers like culture, practices, mental models, lack of psychological safety, and more. So if you're trying to implement anything that requires engagement, how people feel about one another imposes a significant constraint. The technology can remove some of the constraints, but you're going to consider patterns of behavior and mental models that um, are required to make that solution successful. So if you think about it, the adjacent possible also has its own adjacent possible. As we move into the adjacent possible and make what could be into what is, new possibilities open up. Invention begets invention. In his book, Where Good Ideas Come From, Stephen Johnson describes a stacked platform of innovation. You can see it clearly in the evolution of computing and internet technology. Advances by academia and government for their purposes opened up possibilities for the commercial uh, or private sector. This means that every step into the adjacent possible has the potential to open up pathways to potentially even more beneficial solutions. Things get even more interesting when we add the concept of exaptation into the mix. I didn't exactly know where to put this into my talk here, but I'm going to put it right here. So exaptation is when something is repurposed for another use and also comes from evolutionary theory. Many, if not most, biological traits started as something different. For example, feathers were originally to keep dinosaurs warm, but were repurposed to aid in flight with the evolution of birds. New value is gained from something already in existence that the overarching system already supports. Now it stands to reason that exaptive innovations are more likely within the realm of the adjacent possible because they leverage technologies or platforms that already exist. For example, some of the most effective methods I had to innovate within some of my previous units involved adapting existing platforms for different purposes. I didn't have the same lift with regards to implementation because the platforms were already embedded within the organization. I did this by, for example, creating trackers in SharePoint, which is well supported, instead of trying to get them to adopt whole new technologies for doing things, which is likely to run into the constraints of resourcing, mental models, etc., which prevents something from being within the realm of the adjacent possible. This is also why the Kinevin framework calls for exaptive practice and complexity. The most expedient and effective strategy to operate in complexity where you can't reliably predict cause and effect in advance involves probing the system for its current state, sensing out adjacent possible states, and responding in a way that nudges the system in a positive direction. So exaptive practices are routes to the adjacent possible because they take advantage of what already is rather than trying to introduce too much newness. In complexity, any change can result in unanticipated effects so we want to identify pre-existing positive patterns that we can take hold of and amplify rather than trying to manufacture a whole lot of new agents and effects at once. Too much complexity in what we introduce will also make it impossible to know what aspects of the new system are helping or harming. Exaptive innovation is like what Carmen Medina describes in her TEDx, How to Be an Organizational Heretic, as entering through an adjacency. She says, find an area, if you can, that is important to the organization, that suits their values, that you can use to package your own idea or some portion of them. Identifying and taking advantage of existing patterns within an organization or community that are already supported by culture, processes, and mental models can be a very effective method of what I would refer to as exaptive innovation, although some might disagree with me. So I'd say the Air Force Gaming community, Air Force Gaming, the organization, 
creating a community of gamers to bring people together to solve this these issues of resiliency and morale is a form of exaptive practice, in my opinion. It takes advantage of existing patterns in order to create patterns for new value to be created, right? That's a terrible sentence. People were already gaming, and gaming was already bringing them closer together. There was this existing trend that other solutions could latch onto to try and deliver new value. This is why in the book uh, Switch, How to Change When Change is Hard by Dan and Chip Heath, they have a chapter on looking for bright spots. Look for where the patterns you're looking for are already occurring. Look for where in the organization the problem is already being solved. If only in tiny pockets, it might provide exaptive avenues into the adjacent possible. So in the in the application of design and facilitated discovery and innovation practices, a solid scoping effort will determine a lot of what is, a lot of what could be the adjacent possible, and even more of what could be if things were slightly different. The adjacent possible is adjacent possible. I started writing about this subject recently as we were going through this design sprint with the Centers for Adaptive Warfighting uh, and Air Force Gaming. We got to the point where we were identifying potential solutions to clear problems, but pinning down the scope of what we should try and tackle was a particularly tricky part. In our discussions at this phase, it became apparent that there were a number of things that would likely be hugely impactful, but might be just out of reach due to constraints. Someone observed that if one solution was introduced, it might open up the doorway to more impactful solutions entering into the adjacent possible, perhaps worth getting after once we'd opened up that possibility. And this is actually really interesting. This is what got me thinking about this subject. Your chosen solution does have to be within the realm of current possibility. So it has to be within the adjacent possible. You'll have to consider all the things that might prevent a solution from possible implementation usually fitting within the realm of desirability, feasibility, and viability. So perhaps the culture isn't ready for your solution. Perhaps you couldn't possibly acquire the funds or support needed to get it off the ground. Maybe users wouldn't adopt your solution even though it would solve all their problems. That solution is outside the realm of the adjacent possible. You could say it's in the adjacent possible's adjacent possible. If things were slightly different, it would be possible, but things aren't different. Your solution requires something to bring it within the realm of the adjacent possible. This is like a lot with a lot of my efforts to get facilitated practices adopted by units I belonged to or across the Air Force over the past few years. What I found was that getting these things adopted even at a small scale was beyond my adjacent possible. I expended all my energy trying to do it. But by myself, I couldn't convince people to take the time necessary to experience these methods. And I also needed significantly more practice as a practitioner to make those experiences really impactful. Right? I needed support. I was burning out. So what I ended up ultimately doing was starting a community for facilitation and design within the DoD, the Sagittari, because something much more fundamental needed to happen for loan facilitators like me before we could even start to worry about adoption and application at scale. And Agitare, the selected solution in this case, along with other amazing organizations like the Centers for Adaptive Warfighting and Air Force Cyberworks, have opened up new possibilities entering into the new adjacent possible now. And it seems much more within reach for facilitated practices and human-centered design to become the norm within the Air Force and DOD. So this is another thing that's got me thinking about this. Adjacent possibles, adjacent possible, is sometimes what we need first is a community or a culture solution. Something to bring those greater, more impactful solutions within reach. So that brings us to the next idea, which is stepping stone solutions. Sometimes you identify a potential solution but it's outside the realm of possibility right now. In order for that solution to become possible, you need to create new possibilities to expand the adjacent possible. For example, if a solution wouldn't be adopted because of cultural perceptions, which impeded desirability, you could use some other solution as a stepping stone. 
your stepping stone solution could be an initiative that changes perceptions and culture. This might not seem like it directly solves the issue at hand, but it does open up the possibility for the actual goal to come within reach. For example, Tesla's electric vehicles could not initially be sold as all around drivers for families with only one car, not without the mature infrastructure needed for recharging stations everywhere that people might wanna drive. So they first targeted the market of people just looking for another commuter vehicle who could afford to have more than one vehicle, some of which might be for short distance and others for long distance. And selling to that initial market made it possible to gradually build up the infrastructure necessary for Tesla to release their more affordable daily driver, Model 3. This reminds me of a, of a thing, I, uh, uh, another aspect, which is a thing I heard from a- the Airbnb founder, Brian Chesky, on the podcast, Masters of Scale. He says, in order to scale, do things that don't scale. What he's talking about there is running experiments that result in learning, but aren't intended to ultimately become a scalable solution. I think it's a version kind of of the lean startup model of, of the minimum viable product, which is intended to get you to the simplest possible version of your product that will result in validating your hypothesis of value. But suggesting that you do things that don't scale is a novel concept, I think, to a lot of people. Because many people see the whole MVP thing as something that's supposed to be scalable, not just a method of research. And I think it's interesting to think about whether we could use things that don't scale as stepping stone solutions to create the possibility to do things that do scale. The last thing I want to touch on is the idea of expanding the adjacent possible. We should be well aware of the fact that changing conditions for a given context can expand the adjacent possible. We can open ourselves up to new possibilities if we identify some of the constraints that limit our capacity for exploration and evolution. Our evolutionary potential goes up when we move the constraints further out from just what already exists. And I kind of touched on this a lot on the subject of internal complexity with my piece, May We Mutate for Over the Horizon. Um, Our evolutionary potential goes up when we move the constraints further out. For example, if we consider how knowledge can limit our capacity for growth, we can increase the flow of knowledge into and throughout the organization by adopting better practices of communication, increasing the amount of white space that individuals within our organization have, to go out and get knowledge, to bring it back, experiment, and share within the organization. So we can reduce the resource constraint by opening up new avenues for gaining resources, by adopting sourcing methods that allow us to borrow and experiment with the resources of others, by adopting things like low-code and no-code platforms that allow us to experiment without any type of acquisitions happening, or the need to give people the capacity to code, for example. So a lot of these innovation enabling or limiting constraints occur at the team and unit level. And just by adopting better cultures, information sharing technologies, and better practices for ensuring that information moves throughout our organizations, this will expand our adjacent possible. So those are just a few thoughts I was having that I wanted to try and convey through some fun illustrations I made on uh, Miro on the subject of innovation strategy and practices. I hope you've found this interesting. Please do feel free to comment, like, and share. I did stop paying for my subscription to Adobe Premiere, so apologies for my less than stellar editing on this one, but I'm not making videos fast enough. Maybe I can get someone to fund that subscription for me. I don't know. Anyways, talk to you next time.